Thank you everyone for being here. It's great to see so many people interested in the application of deep learning towards designing smart materials. I am Shalini Ananda. I'm the co-founder of a company called Quantified Skin here in San Francisco. I'll be speaking about our technology, New Silico, that we've had since early 2013, and New Silico is a deep learning-based technology. Uh, when we started, we initially tested New Silico against data sets from nanoparticles that were cured for cancer treatments. And today we apply this technology wholly in the personal care space. So um, deep learning is very much in the media today, but wasn't so much in the media in early 2013 when we started. The idea, or I would say the fascination behind deep learning is that it removes a lot of the laborious feature engineering that engineers have to perform. And this has um, certainly added a lot of value in the search and advertising space. In the material or the biology space, I'll make the argument here today that it is still essential to perform some feature engineering. And to illustrate my point, um, I would like to give you the analogy here that a five-year-old can identify a variety of cookies as a cookie, but it takes learning and knowledge for a person to view a molecular structure and identify it as the molecular structure of graphene and then draw inferences from a chemical equation associated with this molecular structure. So this is the challenge when we try to directly apply a technology that's used in certain advertising to material science and biology. And as deep learning engineers who are dedicated towards advancing material science and also solving biological problems, we have to perform feature engineering and also carefully construct knowledge bases for our learner algorithms. Uh, in a field like this, it is pertinent that the learner algorithm can learn and update its knowledge bank from scientific publications. At this stage, the knowledge base building algorithms are very specific to grabbing parameters that can find to certain thresholds and reject anything outside of these thresholds. So we're still not looking into why the causes of some of these outliers, but we are focusing specifically on data sets that are within the confines of uh, quote unquote acceptable threshold uh, in the scientific community. To understand some of these steps around feature engineering for deep learning, let's delve quickly into a researcher's approach for building new materials. The first step is to determine the role of a material system. Uh, in other words, we look at the function of the material. How is this function triggered and how should this material respond? We examine the molecular components that would provide these results. And the pre-processing and the knowledge base has to be created to understand these triggers and responses. The next step from a biological standpoint is it's essential to study how long it would take for the material to reach the site of action. This is called half-life, and also we should understand where else it would go into the body. This is called biodistribution, and these factors are important to study because this is how we determine if there will be an adverse effect associated with this material. Uh, today, Quantified Skin has a very comprehensive feature engineering toolkit and also a knowledge base to study material molecular interaction for the skin, hence the name quantified skin. To businesses that have to innovate quickly, the advantage here is being able to assess ideas and outcomes very quickly. For instance, in the nanoparticle engineering space, there are roughly 10 different kinds of nanoparticles, six general parameters you can change, and 43 variants of each of these parameters. So you're ultimately looking at 10 to the power of 258 experiments you need to run. These are, this is a lot of experiments and it's impossible to run all of them in a given amount of time. But using computation, once these options um, for optimal materials are presented, we can pursue them via experiments. 
we performed rigorous validation of our experiments in the nanoparticle field, as I mentioned before. And the way we worked with researchers in this field is that they provided us raw characterization data for unpublished experiments. And we estimated biodistribution and half-life and compared it to biodistribution and half-life results that they got internally from their animal experiments. So the uh, correlation coefficient between the prediction and observed in both instances um, for these two materials that we're looking at here was greater than 0.9. And just to delve into a little bit about why we ended up with deep learning, when we started, we started with a polynomial SVM kernel um, that had a lot of feature engineering, so to speak. And as you can see here, what we got with the deep learning uh, using a lot less features was much better than what we got with our SVM polynomial kernel with a lot more features. And this is one of the reasons we settled uh, for our deep learning technique. To give you an idea of um, how much time computing optimal design for materials can actually save, um, in one instance, we had a researcher who was working on a project for about 39 months and um, using new silica, we helped her optimize the ligand to nanoparticle ratio. And it took her one month to achieve the objective that she was actually looking for with her material. And to summarize this entire presentation, we certainly think the the future of personalized health lies in the ability of being able to build personalized therapy systematically where we understand the target cells we're trying to target. Um, we determine the nature of the material associated with these target cells and we're able to optimally design uh, a material for this um, to achieve the function that we're looking for. Uh, thank you for listening.